Well, we're picking up where we left off a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> before my voice gave out, um, and it seems like it's you know, kind of on the edge here. We'll see how this goes. Um, and we had been looking at the doctrine of God from chapter 2 in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Um, we basically looked at, uh, I believe it's paragraph 3, in sort of who is God, um, to, drawing from Westminster. There's sort of these two different approaches who is God and what is God? Very famously in the Shorter Catechism, we ask our kids to memorize what is God. And uh, it may seem a little odd to us to ask the question, what, when God is a who? And so Westminster has this sort of two-sided approach where we can ask the question, who is God? But ultimately, that's sort of a Trinitarian question where we're asking uh, who are the persons of God? What are their relationships one to another? So we discussed that um, previously. Uh, got into a good, uh, you know, bare knuckle brawl, uh, you know, over uh, Nicene and Chalcedonian uh, Trinitarianism. That's a joke. And uh, <laughs> we have uh, tonight sort of a more, uh, I don't know, more accessible um, and yet nonetheless. Uh, inspiring and humble approach to God. Paragraphs 1 and 2 of chapter 2 in the Confession. Dealing primarily uh, with the character of God, or what we sometimes call the attributes of God. Uh, answering that question, what is God? Um, what is God is, is maybe a better way to, to, to uh, be understood as an abbreviation of the question, what is God like? What is God? That is, what is he like? How do we describe him? How do we imagine him to be in his relationship to creation, to us, and to the world? So what is his revealed character? What are his attributes and his likeness or unlikeness to us and what we know in the world? So that's kind of uh, what we'll look at tonight. Having talked about his persons, having talked about his being, now let's talk a little bit about his character how he relates to the world, how he is known in the world. What is the first rule from a couple weeks ago when discussing the doctrine of God? What is rule number one? Use the Bible. All right, use the Bible. It's not what I was thinking, but I cannot <laughs> correct it. And that is absolutely correct. Yes. <laughs> What is rule number two? <laughs> Very good. Yeah, you must use the Bible. This is where God has made himself known in a comprehensible way. I was thinking uh, with us, uh, humility and limits. When we talk about God, we are talking about something, someone, who should inspire worship and praise it should not always be a relentless pursuit of perfect comprehension. We must with humility understand there are things we will not grasp. There are things I cannot explain. And what is more, the purpose of knowing God is that we would worship him, that we would adore him. So this knowledge of God, is, as we go through these different attributes and we look at the character of God, we should never approach this information as mere information. We should never approach this list of God's character or attributes as something divorced from him, as a being to be known, adored, revered, and loved. Okay? So, so I hope to communicate that as I talk about these attributes, that these are not merely things we know about him, but things which inspire our love for him. So there are, two, there are several different ways to organize the lists of attributes or characteristics uh, that we often associate with God. And one of those uh, most common ways, does anybody know for bonus points, 100 points? Uh, maybe it's worth 1,000 points, I don't know. It's, yeah, the question is, is or, dividing the attributes of God into two categories. What are the more common categories? Yeah, very good. Carol gets 1,000 points. Um, for those who are wondering, the points go away and they don't mean anything. Um, 
Carol uh, gets a thousand points. Communicable and incommunicable attributes. Um, when your neighbor child who was playing with your kid yesterday has a disease, which one do you want it to be? Communicable or incommunicable? You want it to be incommunicable. Why? Because then your kid doesn't have it. That's right. So a communicable thing is something that you can communicate. It's something that can go from A to B. It is something that can be transmitted or passed along. Incommunicable, then, is the disease you want the neighbor kid to have. It stays with him. It doesn't come into your house. So we often divide uh, God's attributes and characteristics rightly uh, between these two categories, the communicable and the incommunicable. Those which we have in common with him and those that we don't have in common with him. Can anyone see sort of just an initial critique of this taxonomy? It, what, what's maybe a weakness? One, it's a mild thing. Communicable and incommunicable is not a bad way to organize it. But what's maybe a weakness in that distinction? It's connected to the idea of humility as we approach God. Do we really have anything in common with God in a sense? Yes, we have knowledge and God has knowledge. Yes, we have righteousness and God has righteousness. That's like saying I have money and Bill Gates has money. Only more so. Yes, it is true. They, they are shared. They are communicable. But they're really, really different. God's righteousness is not on the same plane of reality as my righteousness. Okay? So with that in mind, I, I kind of want to take that same category, but I want to use a slightly different distinction. God is... Transcendent, somebody spell check for me. And God is imminent. Somebody spell check that one for me. Imminent. A -M -E -N -T. Uh, say it again. A I M N A M. Are we on the bottom? Imminent means happening soon. I M A M E N T means. I M M A N. Yeah, that's it. E N T. Thank you. Yes, imminent. Thank you. Uh, so transcendent, this is generally what I'm associating with the incommunicable attributes, imminent, the communicable attributes. So in another way to say it, that which is absolute, unique, far off, unattainable. That which is near or familiar or relatable. Does that help a little bit? I, I hope that sort of massages the incommunicable, communicable distinction into a, a little more understandable terminology for us. These are the, the features of God's character that are absolutely unique to which we have no relation or full comprehension. These are the features or characteristics of God that we can kind of relate to, that we can kind of experience in the world in an intelligible and accessible way. So this is unique uh, and when I say unique, I mean absolutely unique. Other. Um, not like us. And this one is uh, familiar. As in close or proximal. Okay? So, um, let's, let's look at uh, sort of the character of God in this sort of, of way of understanding him. Um, and, and I do have a method to this. There's a reason why I want to use this sort of language. Um, so the first characteristic of God that is under the transcendent category is his say. This came up a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the Trinity. I think Stephen and I afterwards were discussing this. What is his aseity? Obviously, Stephen has to pass because he knows because we talked about it two weeks ago. Yeah, this is not a familiar word, is it? I remember uh, sitting, I think it was in Geneva College, and some professor slapping a seity up on the board, and I'm going, ah, I don't know that one. Self-existence, not contingent, not dependent, 
God is entirely contained within himself. He does not need anything else. Is anybody else going, yeah, that makes sense? I hope not. This is, this is the transcendent characteristic. He, he, he is not creaturely. There is no dependency or contingency in who he is. He is entirely himself, needing nothing else, entirely contained and entirely complete, self-existent, okay? This is transcendent. This is not something we experience here. Everything, to use Kohelet's language, everything under the sun is not this. Everything under the sun is contingent, dependent, derived. He's not. So the uh, correct answer to the kid's question, right? Well, who made God? Where did God come from? The answer is, and he has a say to kid. And then you have to explain that. <laughs> no, he, he is always there. There is no derivative to him. He is always in and of himself. Then some more familiar ones. What is infinite? I can hear with my back to you. Okay, yeah, with, without limit. And, and we kind of have to e- explain, you know, th- these different words and their, and their uniquenesses. You know, that, that we understand God is infinite, that is boundless and without limit. He is not contained or bounded. By eternal, we mean a specific type of infinity, right? What does eternal mean? An infinity of, I saw it mouthed in the back, time, an infinity of time. So eternity is an infinity of time. Can we speak of humans as eternal? We never die, but we have a starting point. Uh, Yeah, very good. Um, Often in your English Bibles, it will refer to the immortal soul or perhaps everlasting when referring to heaven or hell. Everlasting is an intentional effort to distinguish from eternal, which has no beginning and no end. We, uh, as an immortal, possessors of immortal souls, are not eternal. We have a beginning, but we do not have an end as such. Um, we, we will die, of course. A mortal life will end, but then comes eternity in judgment or blessing. What about Immutable. Not changing, not able to mutate. Where's my biologist? Yeah, not able to mutate, not able to change. Uh, God is ever as he was. Um, Embedded in this idea, it's an interesting experience in today's sort of religious culture. This also means that God is unaffected. Okay? So, So God is not subject to experience. He, he is immutable. Um, so he does not have, in the words of the ancient confession, parts or passions like we do. He, he is not reactionary. So we, we cannot speak of God as, as being someone who's responding to something. He doesn't. He is immutable. He ever is. And is always as he is. He is indivisible or, uh, well, I could say it as indivisible um, in, in theological conversation, it's, it's also God is simple. That's often a misleading term. God is simple, but not like that. <laughs> God is simple in that, uh, who was I speaking with just this morning? We were talking about the knowledge of God. Somebody, oh, it was uh, Pete McLaughlin. I uh, was asking about the knowledge of God in eternity. His thought is one. He doesn't think one thing and then think another. He thinks all things at once as one. He he is simple and indivisible. He is entirely within himself. He is God. Again, at this point, I'm kind of running through these and just giving you an introduction. The reason for that is, is anybody following this? Like, There's a sense in which you should understand this. There's a sense in which you should sit there and go, I'm not sure what that means. We shouldn't. This is God. There is true mystery here. And that brings us to this then. He is in 
Breathe it in. Calm, free. Pensable. Maybe if I write it aboard as long as Dr. Watt, I'll be as neat as his handwriting is. Um, incomprehensible. God in and of himself with these kinds of characteristics is not something we wrap our mind around. Have you, have you heard the illustration of how uh, describing God, theologians or sometimes religions are, are sometimes compared with four blind men trying to describe the elephant. One has a leg, one has a trunk, one has a tusk or an ear and one has a, a tail. And it's like, the elephant is like a snake. No, that's his tail. The elephant is like a tree. No, that's his leg. The elephant is like on and on. They're describing these different parts of the elephant. That is not at all what theology is like. It's a, it's a terrible illustration. Um, one, we are not simply blindly reaching for information. God has spoken to us. We are not blind men groping in the dark. We are those sitting in the light, watching what God has revealed to us. But secondly, we can only know what has been revealed to us. Our brains do not go beyond the Bible and perceive the nature of God outside of it. There is a sort of a caveat to that statement. Does anyone know what it is? We, of course, know him in creation, right? And we know him in our conscience. He is, he is revealed to us naturally. But there we know him as existing. There we know him as angry. And that's about it. it, it it's a fairly limited knowledge. So apart from the scriptures, God is not something that we reach and comprehend in these ways without the scriptures. So then God is spirit. Who knows your children's catechism? Does God have a body? No. God is a spirit and does not have a body like men. Yeah. These are familiar, right? These are, these are good answers, good questions. God is a spirit and does not have a body like men. So when God says, I brought you up out of Egypt with an outstretched arm and a mighty hand... So when God says, I will make my back pass before you, Moses, so that you can see the backside of my glory, what is God doing? Very good. He's communicating. He's communicating to little brains who can't understand how a spirit reveals himself. And so he uses language that we can relate. And he says, I stretch out my hand against you. And we go, God doesn't have a hand. And he says, I will reveal my back. And, and Moses goes, you don't have a back. You are infinite. There's no limit. There's no front side. There's no back side. And God goes, but I'm speaking to you in a way that you can understand. I'm making myself understood by you. So he is also then independent. This is uh, related to aseity, of course. We already said that, in that he is self-existence and self-contained. Um, but independent is um, more of the idea of what I was drawing out of immutable, that God is not affected, that God is not uh, a, a being to be subjected to emotions, to experiences. He is not dependent. He is not relying on other things or responding to other things. He is himself existing and operating in the world. He is the original agency in the world. And so all of this summed up together, when we say that God is transcendent, he is other, he is above, what we are saying is he alone is worthy of worship. These are statements of supremacy. These are statements of otherness, of uniqueness. He is not creaturely. He is not like us. He is other. He is unique. He is himself. He is, if we were to sum up these uh, isolation things, as he himself has says, I am who I am. I am me. I am myself. And I cannot be other. 
Um, I'm going to get there. I, I would not list, I'm not going to list those under transcendent uh, for the sake of tonight's lesson. Does that make sense? So, yes, it is true. We are not all knowing, but we are knowing. We are not all powerful, but we have power. I, I'll, I'll draw that distinction out a little bit more in a minute. You're absolutely right. Those are tr transcendent and unique features of God. Um, but for the sake of a bigger point that I want to make about our relationship with God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off on that. Thank you, though, Chris. That's good. So here's these characteristics and attributes summing up in the idea, simply, he is God, and he should be worshipped. This, this is someone who should be worshipped. When we encounter within the culture and within our own hearts the sense of resistance to, but my God wouldn't, it is these attributes and characteristics that stand as a bulwark against those emotions and sensations. But he's not your God, as if you were to subject him to your reason. He is not your plaything. In the words of Lewis, he's not a tame lion. He is who he is, and he will be who he will be. He will build up and he will tear down, and none can say other. One thing we should recognize as humans is this should inspire within us remarkable reverence and awe. This should inspire within us incredible humility and brokenness and faith in him to say, I cannot resist you. I cannot thwart your will. But there's something else I want us to be very sympathetic to as Christians. This feature about God, this set of attributes about God are often an enormous barrier to faith. Okay? Our friends and our neighbors and our loved ones are often not coming to faith in Christ because of these very issues. And it's not simply this is intellectually hard to understand. There are some around us, some of our loved ones, who are struggling to draw near to God because he seems so aloof and other and unrelatable, cold and distant, and it's intellectually hard to grasp. But a lot of people around us, in, particularly in our culture today, a God who stops here is a God not worth loving. And that's how they see it. Please recognize that a lot of the people around us are stumbling over the ideas that God is sovereign and he rules the world and we in the Reformed community may publish those beautiful truths powerfully and frequently, but we should also recognize to many sinners' hearts, that's a terrifying thing and it is not at all inviting or consoling. D does that make some sense? Like, can you see the emotional boundary that a human could have with a God who is like this. It should inspire humility, reverence, awe, etc. But sometimes it inspires rebellion and a desire to say, I don't want to be under his thumb. I don't want to be under his rule. Okay? But it's, it's, it's found in an incomplete sense of who God is. We should be sympathetic to fellow sinners who find it hard to submit to an all-powerful, all-knowing God. It, that can be hard. That rebellion is not foreign to us. But God has also come near. He is also imminent and known among us. The first thing that we have in common with God is we exist. God exists. We exist. We share this attribute. We both are living Beings. We, we speak of God as having being. We speak of God being and acting in the presence. We speak, he speaks himself of being the living God. That's how he often refers to himself in the scriptures. We too are referred to in the scriptures as living beings. He is living, we are living. This is something we, we have in common. Now, 
again, if we keep drawing sort of upward draft on this list, his life is an eternal life, an infinite life, an unchangeable life. His existence is wholly other. It is not like our existence, which can be terminated. It is not like our existence, which ends in death. Okay? So there is distinction, and yet there is similarity. Um, he is uh, living, he is being, he is present. We also share grace, or rather grace is. By that I mean he is merciful, and we are capable of mercy. Now, in one of the most ironic Bible passages, God says to us, for my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. Now, we often throw that out as a reference to the sovereignty of God. He conducts the world in ways we wouldn't do it. But the verse that's immediately before that is actually a statement of, and I will forgive your sins and have mercy on you. For my ways are not your ways, and my my thoughts are not your thoughts. God actually compares mercy as a distinction between us. That we are usually a vengeful and retribution-oriented people. He's a self-denying God. He's a God of mercy. And so he is merciful. He is loving. And once again, uh, one of the most, it's, it's one of the few Hebrew words I have burdened you with and insist that you guys know. It is chesed, steadfast love, covenant love, faithful love, unfailing love, unending love. When we speak of God's love, we are speaking of a warmth, of a favor, of an affection that is insurmountable and unbreakable. This is quite unlike our love. This is quite unlike our love, which is so easily eradicated by our spouse's minor failings. It is quite unlike our love that evaporates with the child who left Legos under our feet. It is quite unlike our love, and yet we love, and he loves. He is forgiving, and the scriptures repeatedly say we must forgive as he forgives. He forgives, we forgive. There is a relationship between us being forgiving creatures. He is patient. Technically, we are capable of patience. It is within human nature to wait. Seldom displayed. But it is within us to be like God and to be patient, humble. How many religions include humility as an attribute of God. And yet God is not self-seeking, but self-denying. Yet God is humble, lowly, mounted on a donkey. That God is of this low heart. And God is generous. Malachi 3. He says, hey, you haven't been bringing the tithes in the storehouse. And you know what? You're not eating very well, are you? Why don't you try bringing the tithes into the storehouse and we'll see what happens. Here's what I'll do. I will open the heavens, heavens for you. In fact, God says in Malachi, let's play a little game. You give as generously as you can to the poor and needy and let's see if you can outgive me. All right, Go. Live generously and see if you can spend faster than I can supply. Let's see. Let's see, let's see if you can do it. God is generous of superlative, generous generosity. So these are the graces. Um, I didn't write them all down. Merciful, loving, forgiving, patient, humble, and generous. Secondly, we share morality with God. He is a moral being. We are moral beings. He is good. We are capable of goodness. By his grace, we perform things that are good. We do good works according to Ephesians 2.10 that he has us to perform. In fact, in Matthew 5.48, this is this funny thing, 5.48, 5.49. I don't remember the verse. Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. 
There is a morality to our nature. We are capable of goodness. We are capable of perfection. Not until you're dead. Don't get excited. But we are, according to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, made perfect in the full enjoying of God forever when we die. That's one of the benefits believers receive at death. So we are capable of goodness and perfection as he is. There is also glory. There is glory to humanity. That humanity stands as a pinnacle in creation. Something full of wisdom and dominance. Something endowed with responsibility. So that the creation would depend upon us. There is a reality that we are to exercise stewardship and responsibility in the creation. Having this glory and this headship among creatures. And this is a small pale reflection of God. A moral being of surpassing glory, of supremacy, of responsibility and dominance in the world. In addition to morality, we share with God integrity. A consistency in nature that again, I, as we go through this, I, I don't know about you, but it's, there's a difficulty for me in teaching this and saying, we have integrity like God. And it just doesn't ring quite there. Yeah, we have integrity as God has integrity. He is holy. That is consistent in purity, in his uniqueness, in his separation from pollution, sin, and stain. We similarly have a capacity for holiness that we might actually wear holy robes as Christ does. He is righteous. We are righteous. There is a conformity and obedience to the law a moral desirability that we have. He is just. We are capable of justice. That we would do what is right and what is good in carrying out compassion and kindness and mercy. He is true and we are capable of truth. That we can conform character to words. That we can conform words to reality. We are capable of truth and integrity as he is. So these are these things that we share with him. There is also self. We have or are a self. God is a self. There is a freedom to us in which we may perform according to our nature whatever is our will. Okay? These are theologically careful words. We may perform according to our nature what is our will. That, I mean, that's exactly the tension I'm having as a teacher to say these things are true of human nature. Um, even totally depraved humans can exhibit integrity at times and in places. It, it, it is part of our nature, but our nature has been damaged. It's been corrupted and darkened. And so integrity is, well, any of these Grace exists, are all things now flawed and damaged, even to the point of fatality. Existence is not the only thing that experiences death. We do have humans in which there is a death of integrity. Um, a, a habitual liar, you know, a, a pathological liar. It, similarly, there, there is a death to our morality, a death to our self and our graces, there is a darkness and a destruction that comes to these characteristics. Blighted though they be, they are not eradicated. We do not cease to be humans. We're just deformed and destroyed humans. We're depraved humans, but still human. Is that kind of? Yeah. And the Bible says we are made in the image of God. Is so that's always been something of an abstract statement to me. But one concrete consequence is that we is is these statements that you're making that we have these properties to some extent, and that sin, though it obscured and marred the image of God, in us didn't erase it altogether either. 
Yes, these are good statements. I like this. Um, this, this is um, an extension of the principle we are made in the image of God, specifically in Ephesians 4, in righteousness and in holiness, a shared moral character. So, that's, so that is the, what when you're saying we have integrity, the argument for that is, starts from we were made in the image of God, God has integrity, and has... Yeah. I don't know if imputed is the right word. He, he has created us in such a way that our nature and our character can be exhibited in consistent manners, hence integrity. We can consistently perform that which we said we would perform, integrity. We can consistently articulate that which is true or real, integrity. Um, so we can speak the truth and we can keep our word. And these are exhibits of integrity, which God himself exhibits perfectly and relentlessly. When God speaks, it is reality. It affects reality. It, it is the truth. It, it is inescapably true and real. When God says, I will do this, it is always performed. He is incapable of... He is not able to not be a creature, now a being of integrity. Yeah. <laughs> so he must be integrity. We, on the other hand, do not have the same perfection that we would express it. Um, this, this is where I'm, it's probably a good time to bring this in, but, but sort of the principle that I'm driving at as I sort of walk us through these, these ideas we have these things in this depraved and broken and incomplete way. God has these things, though familiar to us, in a superlative manner. So this is unique and other. This is superlative. It is the completeness of it. He not only has knowledge, he has all knowledge. He not only is righteous, he is entirely righteous. He not only is honest, he is incapable of dishonesty. Does that make sense? It's, it's a superlative. It's a completeness and an absoluteness to these qualities. Okay? That, that's where I'm, I'm driving at. So where was I? Self, willful. Yeah, so can perform according to our nature um, that which we desire. God likewise performs according to his nature all that he desires. Um, similarly, this was an interesting concept, um, picking up, you know, reading through Westminster. We are both, God and man, beings that desire and beings which are desirable. Some of us may not feel that way. But there is within humanity this duality of we desire... And we are desirable. There is this, this emotive, willful experience within the human that there are things I want in life. And God, though not in the same way, says there are things I want. And there are things I don't want. Things I like and things I don't like. God, though infinitely holy and incapable of passing over the judgment that is due to the wicked, yet says in Ezekiel 18 and 33, I do not delight in the death of the wicked. It is not a desirable thing for him to cast a soul into hell. It is not pleasurable. It is not an expression of what would please him and yet it is a fully pleasing thing to his holiness and his wrath. It is a completely satisfying thing to his justice. Don't ask me to reconcile that. <laughs> Last power. When we talk about God, we talk about a being of power. And this uh, brings us then to, to Chris's question. Um, he is a God of knowledge, but of all knowledge. He is omniscient. He is a God of governance, but of all governance. He is sovereign. He is a God of investment, of complete investment. 
Why did you just take a breath? Why did you just blink an eye? Well, you know, the uh, medical people and the biology people can explain to us that there's this part of the brain that is just, you know, causing your body to perform these, you know, thoughtless subconscious functions so that, you know, to moisten your eye, you, you, you blink, you know. Uh, in order to sustain life, your heart pulses with these electro uh, uh, movements that inspire the muscles to contract. And yet the scriptures teach that we would not be wrong to say that your heart beat because God squeezed it. For he is involved. The one being of which we can be absolutely sure is not a deist is God himself. He is intimately concerned with the well-being of his creation. He says, I know when the sparrow falls out of its nest. And I know how fewer hairs you have this year than you did last year. Yes, I know the number of your hairs. And I know how many went down the sink this morning when you combed them. He is intimately involved. He is completely invested in his creation. And he is, uh, this is the word I put down in my notes. He is omnivision. He is all-seeing. I'm just looking for consistency with omnipotent and, and omniscient. But he is omnivision. He, he is all-seeing. There is nothing that is, not, that is hidden from him. There is no thought that you have carelessly missed in your own subconsciousness that he was not fully aware of. There was no fleeting emotion in your heart that he did not know. He is a God of surpassing and superlative power. So then that lesson that draws it together, when we speak of God, we speak of a being who is unique, who is transcendent, who is other, who is not like us. But we also speak of a being who is familiar and yet superlative in all these ways. And this is the thing that I wanted to come to. One reason I like using the distinction transcendent and imminent is it should bring to, excuse me, into mind another critical doctrine not the doctrine of God, but the doctrine of the incarnation. For one of the defining features of deity within the Christian faith is the belief that we have a God willing to take humanity to himself. A God who is infinite, who is eternal, who is unchangeable and yet willing to enter time and yet willing to be subject to the very forces of creation that he made. He is willing to actually join his creation. How many authors have you known that wish they could be in the book they were writing? How many directors have you known that always end up becoming actors in their own movie? Often to damage to the movie. <laughs> Yet here is God, who is wholly other, who is wholly superlative, who is entirely unlike us and who is entirely better than us, and yet who is entirely interested in being with us. One of the... Uh, most remarkable, humbling, heart-shattering attributes of God that doesn't fit neatly into this sort of category is, uh, I didn't even come up with a great word for it. It's a genius theologian would have come up with a great word for it. Maybe one of you will come up with a great word for it. One of the characteristics of God is this idea of imminence and Emmanuel. That God is with us. That God wants to be known by us. That God is interested in his creation to the point of joining it. To the point of coming into it. In Westminster 7.1 it says that though God could have left Adam in the garden without any fruition for his obedience and labors, God by and these are incredible words, voluntary condescension. For no other reason 
Then he wanted to be with Adam. He walked in the garden in the cool of the day, like a father with a son. And he bound himself. He covenanted with them. And, th- and that's kind of the, the, the big idea that I'm drawing, drawing down to. That God is willing to bind himself. To seal himself with us. He is willing to put on the proverbial wedding band. And be united to a people. To a creature. To a creation to take to himself a human nature. This is our God. This is his characteristic. I remember being in a different presbytery uh, when I was a student under care. And uh, a student, not me, was asked, uh, what are the characteristic, what are the um, marks of a true church? And like a good, good Reformed Presbyterian, he said, Sound preaching of the word, right administration of the sacraments, and church discipline. Some father in the faith, I actually don't remember which one, stood up and said, I hope that love is a mark of the true church. Similarly, we must never discuss the majesty and the beauty, the awesome character and attributes of God without grasping his intense love and desire to be with us, to be known among us as Emmanuel. That must be a critically important attribute to us if we are to know God as he wants to be known, worship God as he wants to be worshipped, love and obey and serve God as he wants to be loved and obeyed and served. I kind of fire hose tonight. And I'm kind of not sorry. It's good stuff. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I didn't invest involve you more, but but uh, I really enjoyed that stuff. So anyway, any any questions? Now's your chance. Now that I've lulled you all to sleep, go ahead. I was gonna say one concept that's been useful to me in linking together a lot of these categories is that God created time. Uh, it's not like something you naturally think of, but it's really fundamental to a lot of these, like his uh, aseity and independence come naturally if you realize that he is not within time, Mm -hmm. and that's something that he himself created during the creation, as well as his immutability. God can't be changing. You can only change if you're in time, because change is a measurement between two different points within time. If you're outside of it, you can't change. Similarly, I think it shows the difference between a deist God, who's like, they say like the watchmaker who set things up. You know, in such a way that they can change over time as they departed from his creation. But God is not like that because his, everything is in eternal present before him. And that's how, even if he uses secondary causes like, you know, natural causes, those still his finger selecting and choosing those things to happen because it's just like the present. It's not as if this is a sequence of events he couldn't have foreseen or whatever. No, he's reaching into the world through that natural cause and enforcing his will mm-hmm. at that time. His sovereignty is immediate. And yet supreme. It's beautiful. Yeah, he is outside of time, having installed it as part of his creation. Thank you. Any other brilliant thoughts? Or not brilliant thoughts? Sounds like I can be sharing the attributes of God today, but I think it's good to reflect that the wickedest man on earth is not a wicked dictator. And, and even a, even a dictator has at some point to uh, submit to some kind of teaching and show some kind of moral sense. It's, it's not that, that it's not it doesn't take away from salvation at all. People are, and I think you put your finger on when you said about the moral sense. It's a hard thing because we know we're sinners, but we, we really do receive this. God, in His grace, restrains 
the depravity of man. And for that truth, we should be eternally grateful. We are not as evil as we can be. The world is not as evil as it can be. It's evil enough. But we should be grateful for his restraining grace. Yes. Along those lines, sometimes we get we sort of flip to look around. It's not that we're as bad as we can be, it's that every part of us is, is contaminated by our So there's no part of us that can sort of bootstrap us into goodness. Because right. It's all, yeah. All fallen. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's one of, of uh, completeness that the entire human is depraved. Yeah. As compared to the human is as depraved as he can possibly be. That, that is not the case, by God's grace. Metaphor, uh, this is a brilliant thought, but it's just not my own thought. I stole it from somebody else. A metaphor I found really helpful is describing our, our image bearing as a broken mirror. Yes. Even a broken mirror reflects, uh, albeit it has its, its problems, major problems, depending on how broken it is. And I've always found that helpful. I, I, that uh, metaphor came to my mind, and, uh, and, and I didn't use it because the only one I could credit for getting it from is, is my professors at Geneva. Um, because that's where I heard that metaphor. Is we the, stole it. <laughs> perfect. It was in uh, uh, 112 and 113, which I didn't take, but I taught. Um, so uh, the idea that God made us as mirrors to reflect his likeness, his character, his, uh, his glory in the creation. And in the fall, that mirror is shattered. And you can still see God. But it's distorted and it and it's and it's uh, confused. Yeah, very good. I'll go with you and then Daniel. When you list about the graces that are communicated to us, um, that list is very similar to a fruit of the spirit. Yes. Yeah, a um, uh, great little uh, bit of Latin. We have the Mago Dei, right? The image of God, these things that we have in likeness with him. There is also uh, what they would refer to as sensus divinitatis. Latin scholars, anybody? Uh, sense of our divinity. Um, there is this, this idea, certainly um, within the book of Genesis, for instance, that all humans have this breath. It's also in Ecclesiastes. But in Genesis and Ecclesiastes, this idea that human life is a breath, a divine breath. So there's a sense in which we can say all humans have the spirit within them. Hence, they live. Um, and then they exhale and the spirit returns to God and they don't live anymore. Now, that is not the same as the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That is not the same as the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, which has now indwelt us, regenerating us, and then sanctifying us, resulting in the performance of these graces and the perfection of this humanity. I, I think one thing that is so important to come to the covenantal Emmanuel concept when we talk about the attributes of God is the idea that Jesus himself in his person united divinity with humanity. And subsequently, all those who believe in Jesus, so this equals Jesus. Just to make that clear. Um, so that all those who are united to Jesus similarly share this full indwelling of the Spirit, and thus, like Jesus, gradually become perfected humanity as he was perfect human. But all humans share these shattered and broken things by virtue of their imago dei, but also by virtue of this life which they have from God. Does that help with the distinction there? Okay. 
this property of God that we're talking about here, this uh, relational quality. Yes. This, the, so that's something that obviously we don't desire to have a relationship with something that has wronged us so very much, but is, is maybe one of the, the ways in which that's shadowed in our experience. Is that what things like marriage are supposed to be? That's a good question. Um, yes, we, we, we are relational beings, and in that way, we image God who is relational. But also, but this is covenant relation. Yes, we are also creatures who will formalize and, and bind ourselves covenantally in relationship which is also like God. I want to say yes, but I don't want to say yes unqualified and say too much. Does that make sense? <laughs> uh, <laughs> there, there, there are sharks in the deep water. <laughs> uh, so yes, God is relational, and God, uh, by weight of his own glory and by virtue of his own integrity, when God says, I will be with you, that's a covenant just because he's so glorious and he's so honest when he says, yes, that is a legally binding statement because he cannot lie. We're a little different. We take the extra step of, of formally, legally binding our promises because we need something that exceeds the quality of our own character. Like diamonds and gold rings and which has more integrity than we do sometimes. Okay. Well done. Very good. Thank you. Uh, let's close in prayer, and then we will sing. Thank you for grabbing your salt. That reminded me. Whatever I told you we were going to sing. 145A. 145A. <laughs> How about I close this in prayer and then let's sing 145A. Our Father in heaven, we are again in awe before you. We are again uh, aware of the incredible majesty you have given to humanity in the creation and the incredible ruin that we have wrought upon ourselves and upon this world. And we ask, O oh God, for this great mercy and love about which we have heard that it would flow free again tonight and that we would draw to an end of our sweet time of rest and of fellowship and of worship, rejoicing in the wonder of who you are and how you treat the world. We marvel that you would wish to be among us, that you would crave our company and our praise, feeble and broken and unworthy as it is. And we give you thanks for our Jesus who has taken humanity to himself that he might perfect in us the creation that you made so well so long ago. Our Father, warm our hearts tonight to the wonder of who you are and all that you have done, that we might now, according to the psalmist, give you praise, our God and King, and extol you every day. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.